so first task is to create the random, the first task we're going to be working on anyway, is to create the random color extension Oops. method. By the way, uh, all these issues are on the repo, same repo. So if later on or later on the week or whatever, if you guys want to do the PRs, we'll set to that. Mary, do you need help getting going? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, we're just going to gap through this. Again, all of these are branches, so if you don't keep up, don't worry about it. You can pull the next branch and you'll be caught up. So, first things first, we need to create a random a extension method that will do that will return a random color so that we don't have to call the same method every time in our, um, our uh, spout. Right? So right now, we have to have this method. You're going to learn something about C-sharp, by the way. We have to have this method inside here if, because we want to return a random color for any one of these things. That sucks. Because now, I mean, we're going to have to create random colors often in many projects. It would be so much better to just be able to extend the class color and have a random come off of that. So we're going to modify this. We're going to do so by creating a new script, again in scripts. We're going to name this script extension methods. Happily so. Everybody see this okay? Uh, extension methods. So you right click, anybody that's just getting started, right click, create. Okay. And then you have a clip on that once you get that created, that's going to pop this up. Like this. Again, don't worry, too much about this. Guys. Okay. Okay. So we're going to create the extension method. Okay. Extension method. Okay. 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 Um, a new method. We're going to make this a public method that returns a color. This is the return type. We're going to call it random. Now, the difference between most methods and an extension method is the keyword this. We're going to say this color, color. And what we're doing here is we are referring when we say this, we're referring to the class color as opposed to the parameters that we normally pass in, which is where we would pass in a color. So now we're referring to the color class. So, uh, could you zoom in a bit? The, I can try. It's a control plus sign. How's that? Yeah, that's good. Better? All right. This color. Cool. Uh, let's format this. Almond style sucks, right? Everybody agrees. Alright, so to do a random color, we need the three random RBG, right? You do four if you want to do the alpha. Um, so we're gonna create a uh, we're gonna create a new color and we're gonna call it return. Or I'm sorry, result. Don't name it return. And new color. We're going to fill what color wants. If you look at it, or one of the options rather, is to pass in four floats: red, blue, green, and alpha. Right. So we're going to randomize this. Fortunately, Unity provides a pretty decent random seed. Um, if you do random value. That is going to return a random number between 0 and 1. And if you know the color schemes, 0 would be black, 1 would be white. So that's like 1 being 100% of 255. 0 being 0. That makes any sense. And we're going to do 1 for each one. And oh, sorry. You'll need to specify this. Because the system has a random two, so it just makes it make uh, sure. Uh, yeah. Don't worry too much. We're gonna. In fact, if you want to go ahead and. Oh. Give me that just over here. All right, and we. 
we just need, we'll do four for the altitude, it doesn't really matter. Do comma. So what this is doing is it's creating a new color with four random numbers between zero and one, which all together is going to give us a random color. Uh, oh, sorry, one other quick difference. Uh, because you want this to be visible to your entire assembly, it needs to be stacked. You only want one of them, and it needs to be uh, uh, visible to your entire assembly. So this needs to be stacked. Uh, oh, and you get rid of your monitor. Uh, let's see. There we go. All right. So, again, the important part, the C sharp is awesome part of this, is that un unlike, well, I wouldn't say, other languages have something similar. C sharp makes this really simple is instead of making a library of methods or adding the same method over and over and over to every every time that you use some useful class like my one example I go to is date time all the time. We write you know modifiers for date time all the time in any application and that sucks having to write that every time. You write extension methods for it, now you'll be able to do new color dot random and you get a random color. You don't have to make a method everywhere that you want a random color. So it's quite nice. Anybody need a pause? Good. Okay, right. so, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm just All right, cool. Sure so now we can bounce over here to spout, and instead of calling this method both these times here that we need this random color, we can simply New color random. Booyah. We could do that anywhere, and we could do that from any color, anywhere that we wanted. If there was some other color that was in use by the application elsewhere, no longer need a method. Think about, I have, imagine I have 25 scripts that use color, right? I would not want to go create this random color or any other color thing that I use often in every one of those scripts, that would totally suck. Instead, I create this extension method, and anywhere that I use the class color, I now can call this random method. It is really cool. Really cool. And because we're not using this anymore, we can get rid of this random. Man, how cool is that? Now we should, if I haven't broken things, be able to switch over here. Make sure this is off. And our festive uh, things are now random colors. Still, and we now create an extension method. Congratulations, everybody. I highly recommend that you um, go and say, do a stash on your uh, get cracking right now. It doesn't really matter. Get the PR list, whatever. But if you went out right now and you did a uh, a branch here, you can submit that for your hack day. Everybody know how to do branches? If you don't, don't worry about it. We'll hit it throughout the week. They should have learned that at your version. Yeah, that's interesting. Day. I see a lot of familiar yeah. faces here. So. All right, cool. We're going to keep building and not submit this yet. But if you are behind, just so you guys know, if you are behind and you would like to catch up to the point we're at now, there is a uh, a branch out there called number what is it? Number four, vast. Uh, yeah, number four, random color vast. If you pull that branch right now, you'll be caught up with us where we're at. That one's already out there, done to this point. All right, first issue down, kicking butt. Let's see, uh, what issue was next? I should have put these in the correct order. Um, oh, child count. All right, so what we're going to do now is we are 
going to child. Probably. Eh, we'll do it. Um, yeah. Basically, we got a bajillion uh, we have a bajillion drops, right? So like when I click on this and we start filling this up, look at that. Who wants to look at that in their thing? That's crazy, right? Plus we don't know how many we got. So what we want to create is a script that simply updates when uh, a new child has been uh, attached to that and updates the name as well so you can see it. So we are going to create a script called Memento. I think I called it Child Count. I need to make sure they I want to make sure the name is correct, you guys, just because uh, if uh, if you submitted the other PR, they might. Hi, yo! Where do you bank? Yeah, right. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, yeah. All right, so we named it. Here's your issues, guys. If you're uh, if you're here. I'm going to tell you right now. Update child challenge. See, I did it wrong. Show child count. It uh, doesn't really matter. You can still. Uh, 
Welcome to Cement the PR. Uh, anyway, so here's the script. Now what I do is first set a serialized field. Remember that exposes it to the editor. Because private variables, private anything, is only accessible inside that class. So serial, serialized field, bool, show child count. That's just basically do we want to update this or not. Uh, I have a string for original name. The reason I do that is because when this starts, we want to know what the name of that parent game object was. So that when we append it, it's not just continuing to append it over and over. What's up? Uh, what was that? Right? You said that it would be called a uh, child. Switch over. Child count best. Yeah, I think it's number something child count best. Okay. So look at Eric. Awesome. If you pull that branch, you'll be right where we are now. Uh, so original name, and then I have an integer. Set the last count. The idea here is. If the count has changed, then we want to update the name. So in our update uh, method, which for those of you that weren't here or aren't familiar with Unity, uh, <laughs> uh, Unity has its own internal methods. That comes from the mono behavior that we're extending. Update runs every frame of the game, every frame. So. Uh, as I was mentioned earlier, that does not mean every second or every half second or anything. It's not a set interval. It's as it can, as fast as it can. That's why in video games you see games want to be 60 frames per second or whatever. That's that's the rate in which it's processing each round. So when we do this, uh, whenever we start the uh, application, it gets the original name, and then every update we check to see. Is, is it show child count true, right? It meaning is it checked? And then is the child count not equal? Transform child count, as you can see, returns the number of children in the parent transform. And is that different than last count? If so, that means something has been added to this. So we're gonna change the game object's name and this is string interpolation, if you guys are aware of this in other languages. What this means is it's going to do the string exactly as it is, but you can put variables inside of these and it will inline them. So what this is going to spit out is whatever the original name was, a space, a open parentheses, a child count number, and a closed parentheses. And then it's going to update last count to whatever the current count is. How are you doing, Jenny? Where did David go? Man, what a bum. <laughs> All right, we good, Jenny? Good? All right, cool. Let's see this in action. So we are going to, oh, we do need to do one other thing because Right now, we're just spawning these um, drops, uh, sort of just spawning them inside. We want them to spawn inside uh, whatever container that we designate. So let's open our spout script, and let's go down to this instantiate line. What this is going to, what you can see here is this is telling us what, what we are instantiating what position we're instantiating it at, the quaternion, which again is black magic, avoid quaternions at all possible chances. And then we have another, which is, sorry, another uh, parameter that is the container, the transform. So what is the parent that you want to spawn this into? Uh, we're gonna put that in a serialized field here uh, for transform called drop container. So in addition to what we already have, you want to see that a little better, we're going to create a new serialized field that is a private transform called drop container. 
and we are going to pass drop container in as a fourth uh, fourth parameter in this instantiate. And what we're again what we're telling it is we're saying okay spawn one of our drops that we've passed in already and do it at this position with basically zero rotation and put it inside of whatever the transform is that we designate. So you can see this on our spout. If you go to our spout, we'll look at our script here. So our prefab is our pumpkin. Our spawn point is the current spawn point. Uh, we got our power, that's how hard our spout is shooting. And then the randomness, it's just that's just so it doesn't shoot directly up. We want it to have a little fun and shoot at some random number or random direction. And then our container here is empty. Oh no, that sucks. So what we're gonna do is take our drops, this game object, and we're gonna drop that in there because that's where we want our drops to spawn into. Cool. Now, the only thing else we need to get our uh, name updating is the method that we created to show and you put that on drops. So now the spout uh, method is going to create these drops. It's going to tell it, stick it in the drops container and then our show child count is going to change the name of drops to drops with the number. You can see it in action. Hopefully. Oh, look at that! Drops, 100, 200, yada, 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 yada. Ta-da! We have a counting whatever. And we have officially solved our second issue. Hooray! Everybody up? Jenny, how are you doing? Come on. Are you? Yeah. It's all right. We can pull. If you know how to pull the things, we're going to go to the next. More important though, Jenny, do you understand the concept that we went over there? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I figured you did. It's just hard to keep up because I talk too fast. <laughs> How you doing, Eric? Um, I was just wondering, so each branch is a PR request we'll be creating, right? Or That's correct. Okay. Yes. And so I that's, why, that's why submitting these PRs this week is going to be quite easy for you guys because I've already done the work for you. You can pull that branch, name it your own, submit a PR, boom, you got Hacktoberfest. That's why I, I did that and I left them out there for you guys. And throughout this talk, if you get left behind, just pull that branch and you'll be up to date. And we just have to refork it, right? And then submit a PR. You don't have to refork it. If you, if you literally pull that thing and create a branch here and name it your branch, you can submit that right there. Because, I mean, I think. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think you have to be a contributor on there to do that, but yeah, it, whatever, it doesn't matter. You can submit it. It's, you know, Everyone should be a contributor anyways. Yeah. Boss, do we need that void start method? Uh, you do? Oh, is it not originally in there? Yeah, this is just the show child count. You don't, this, because we did the work manually, this is a catch-all. If okay. I didn't have a drop container, this would create one for us, but we did it manually. What branch are we on? Uh, currently we are on uh, ground, oh no, sorry, we're going to get to that, the explosion one's fun. Uh, child count vast, but we are about to move to kill zone vast. Man, hey, kill zone is my own name in the same sentence. So that our uh, 
so that our stuff doesn't fall off, right? As you can see, it's all hitting the invisible box colliders. If we go over to the scene view and zoom out, you can actually see all the box colliders, which I can't normally. Uh, that's the reason stuff isn't falling off our board. But if we have some crazy physics collisions or something unexpected, and some of these, say, for instance, shoot off of our board, which can totally happen, um, like this, like this. Oh no! There goes all our stuff. Now, in our game, if our game was running, this would be really bad because we'd have objects that we can't account for following forever. Like using up system resources and who knows, maybe having references that messing up stuff, that would suck, right? So what we're going to do is create a catch-all and we're going to call it the kill zone. And the idea is if anything of these, if any of these drops smash into our kill zone, it's going to just get rid of them, right? And we're going to make this ginormous uh, and, you know, um, cool thing about colliders, especially uh, primitive colliders, like a box collider, it's all math, right? It isn't like a bigger box collider takes up more resources. It's just, I'm either this big or I'm this big, and if anything passes through those numbers, that's a collision, right? Same thing with the sphere collider. It's, I have a radius, and if this object passes in the radius of this thing, that's a collision. So, I'll have to zoom out because this thing's massive. We're going to create a new um, game object. We're going to call it Kill Zone. Uh oh, let me just, yeah, uh, that's fine. New game object. On that game object, we need to add a box collider. Make sure you do box collider, not box collider 2D. So add a box collider. And we need to add a new script. Create a new script. We're going to call it kill zone. And that, that, uh, that is going to look like this. Okay, so now you guys get to learn something that always really impressed me about Unity because it's really smart. So computer in computer language, right, you have different types or different sizes, right? So Boolean, meaning a true or false, is four bytes. So if you wanted to have a whole bunch of Booleans, that's four bytes per, per check of a true or false. Unity uses one byte, but it does it checks through bit shifting to see if it's on or off. And the wonderful thing about this is not only does one byte give you 32 different options, because each one of those bits is either on or off, and you can have any combination in that byte. You now have 32 different options in that one bit. And if you combine that, say your fourth bit and your first bit is, is on and the rest are off, you now can combine those two to see if something is on. So in Unity, they call that a layer mask. Uh, and you can see that in the editor, by the way, up here on layers. And you can, I mean, you can add up to 32 different layers and check to see, and think about, think about the speed of that. If you were checking 32 different things in a game every time a collision happened, not only is that an enormous amount of memory, but just the processing alone, it's so much more than a byte, right? So this is really smart to do this way, especially allowing the combination. So, again, layer mass. So what we're going to do in this kill zone is we're going to create a layer mass, we're going to call it drops layer. Uh, the method that we call in Unity, await, means it's going to fire as soon as the uh, editor is open, or as soon as the script is enabled, uh, or is active, rather. Um, and we're going to set that to the name, uh, layer mask dot name to layer drops. So we're going to say, we're basically saying this variable now equals the name to layer, or the name, the layer drop. And we're going to use the Unity on collision 
which is uh, to detect collisions. We're going to check is other game object layer equal to drop layer. So is what ran into me a drop, or on the drop layer rather? If it is, we want to destroy it. Uh, I'll leave that up for a second. That needs it. Probably got to just pulling branches at this point. That's that's perfectly fine. As long as everybody, I'm more, you know, this is C, about C, doing C sharp. So if anybody has any questions, make sure you ask, because it's more important that you guys understand what we're doing in the language than what's actually going on in the editor. Everybody good? Okay, then I have a question. Yeah, what's up? Um, like in C++, C++, you read, you know, top to bottom down the program, is all C sharp always loop, or is it like C++? So the loop that you're talking about that calls yeah. those methods update, that's in mono behavior. That's a unity thing. However, uh, I mean, you know, C Sharp does, you run your applications in an application loop until it's terminated well. Um, we don't get into it yet, maybe in the future. Um, C Sharp does have await and uh, async, which allows you to, um, let's see, in JavaScript, it's like promises, um, uh, let's see, but yeah, basically it's a uh, wait until something's done or let the, the execution continue. Async? You, yeah, async and await. Uh, yeah, I think JavaScript does an async, right? Yeah. You've been paying attention, it's good. Not really, just enough to know I hate it. But anyway, <laughs> you can't so, yeah. It. Uh, so yeah, so this on collision enter just basically waits for a collision on the, the, oh, and then just so you guys know, I put this requirement up here. Because whatever you want to put kill zone on, you want to make sure that, that it has a collider on it. Um, in the kill zone object, make sure we have the kill zone script on. And then what I've done is just basically set the position of this object 50 below the world and made it, what, 10,000 by 10,000? So if you actually zoom way out here, it doesn't look like much. Again, these are all just numbers, but you can see it's actually way bigger than our our platform. So if anything falls off of this thing and hits this giant 10,000 by 10,000 uh, collider, poof, goes away. Uh, and you can see that in action as we will blow up a whole bunch of, uh, actually let's just turn on our thing. So we have, uh, and uh, take all of our drops that we created here, 2,000 of them. Just drop those down so if anything falls off, you can see it'll go down here and boom. Notice everything's gone. Awesome. How awesome is that? That's PR number four. Now, really, the last one is the most fun. Get the gloves and stuff on. That's the most fun. Uh, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and get all these chains. Uh, and we're going to pull ground explosion fast. Rebuild. Reload. Now, so PR number four. We want to click on our ground somewhere. And when we do so, we want to register that click and add an explosive force and blow some stuff up. That's fine, huh? Yeah. All right, uh, as I mentioned when we started, I threw this uh, test thing into the scene. Uh, I have it turned off by default. You can turn it on if you want. All it does is spawn however many uh, objects you want so that you don't have to sit there and hold the space bar down. So let's just do 2,000. And we'll turn it on. Play. Play. Uh, so, get a whole bunch of objects that are going to spawn. Lots of gumdrops. I know. Pumpkins are more fun, but gumdrops are fun. Mm, let's see. And we're going to add our ground explosion script. So, on ground, by the way, you have to uh, put ground on the ground layer, just so you guys know. If you don't have the ground layer and you're following along, and click that editor and put ground and drops in your layers at the top. But ground, uh, and ground is going to have the ground explosion script, which we're going to 
walk through real quick. Uh, ground explosion just has the force that we're going to explode with, the area in which we want our explosion to happen, how big the area is, and uh, then I have another one that's uh, the upward, because you know an explosion force is just out wherever, but we kind of want this to blow up and out. Right, as opposed to just straight out. So let's take a look at the ground explosion script. This one looks like it's got a bunch of crap in it, but really it's not too awful complicated. Uh, I will explain a couple things, unity things in here that make it interesting. So we're going to have a serialized field with flow blast force. It's like uh, five is a good number. Uh, blast area is one, another good number. You can Again, all these are exposed to the editor, so you can change them yourself. I do have a couple things in here for anybody that might be interested in Unity. Like for instance, I create a reference for camera, and I do this because camera.main, every time you call that, Unity actually goes through and looks for the camera to find the main. So if you cache that at the beginning, that's quite a bit faster. Um, I have two ground layers, our drops and our ground, right? We want to differentiate uh, our clicks do that. And then in our update, we look for a get mouse down zero, meaning zero is left click, one is a right click. Um, I think, yeah, three is middle something. Anyway, zero is left click. If that is registered, meaning we've clicked our mouse, we're going to call check for ground click. Check for ground click is going to call for a ray. And in Unity, ray is just a line, uh, specifically between two points or a point and, infi and infinity. Uh, don't get in the habit of not limiting your rays because that uh, infinite ray is actually quite expensive uh, computationally. So main camera, we're referencing our camera that we set in here. Um, Uh, and we're going to create a new ray, and this screen point to ray means wherever our mouse is forward. And we are looking for, so we're passing in the mouse position. Uh, then we're going to create a ray cast. This ray cast is going from the ray we just created up here. We are using something that is, I would say, not completely unique to C sharp, but somewhat. And this actually is, I don't want to call it dated because it's still in use, but now that C Sharp has tuples, um, there's other ways to do this, maybe cleaner a little bit, but it's the out keyword. And what that means is that if our method creates something inside of it and we want to get that back out, this we can put that in this variable and it will now have access outside of the scope of that. So, because normally we would have to create something and pass in, right, to, to have reference outside of the scope, this allows us to do that with the keyword. So we're going to, whatever our, whatever, our um, whatever it runs into, we're going to spit that out into this variable. Our distance, by the way, you can see all this, our distance is 100. This is kind of an arbitrary number just so that it's not infinity. Uh, and then we're looking to only hit the ground layer. This is important. In fact, I showed my uh, Unity dating, uh, but when I first did this, I couldn't get it to click the ground. I couldn't figure out why. It's because we have invisible walls in front of us. So my ray can be the invisible wall, not the ground, right? So we come in and we say, okay, we we'll only want this to interact with the ground layer, which we have on the ground up. And if we get a hit, we want to call that explosion at the point where our click happened. Where, more importantly, where our click happened on the ground. Now explode. So this is kind of the fun thing, right? So we've got a point on ground where we've clicked. Now we want to say, anything that's in a range of that, we want to affect. So we say, okay, we're going to call something called an overlap sphere. And what that is is basically a ball. 
it just says anything from this point out to whatever we our blast area in this case, we want to get a list of all that. So from the target position, which was passed in from our click, the blast area, we have a variable that, so that's our size of our what's going to be affected. And then only on the drops layer. Again, really important because we may have five, well maybe not five million, but we may have a thousand other objects in the same area that our click happened. We don't want that to affect all of those, only the stuff that's on the drop layer. Really fast, because checking that is only one byte. Really cool thing. Uh, our for each, some other languages, Java, that's just basically iterating through a, um, a collection. Our hits, which was collected from here, uh, we're going to go through and we'll say each one of these things that comes out, we're going to put that in the hit variable, which is a collider. And on that item, we're going to call the game object. We're going to get the rigid body. So if you remember from last time, rigid body allows us to do physics on game objects. We're going to add an explosive force. Now, in that explosive force, I created a method down here just so that we didn't have uh, extra math in here on the, on the line. Uh, it just takes blast force by the blast force multiplier. And the only reason that this is a thing is because otherwise we have to drag our force to like 500. Now we can do it by like 50. Because our blast force up here is set by our multiplier is by 100. Just to make things a little easier. After target position for the blast area with our added upward force, we're going to create an explosion. So in here, on ground, make sure you have uh, your uh, ground explosion script on there. Make sure your layers are all set. And we have a bunch of objects in here that we can blow up. Boom, 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 boom. Anybody want to see how many uh, game objects my computer can handle? <laughs> we got 4,000. <laughs> but it does make the explosion more fun. Is that your fan running right now? Actually, I can keep my fan up a little bit more. <laughs> boom, boom. Yeah, look at that frame rate. Boy. <laughs> Man, look at that. Also, a nice thing about doing development inside the Unity Editor is that whatever performance you get in here, it's going to be better when you compile it, right? Because this is inside the uh, editor. But I got to say, with 4,000 colliders and happening with explosive forces, that's pretty tough without some ECS stuff. So, yeah, boom, boom, we have some explosions. How about that? And that is PR number five. You guys have a Hacktoberfest t-shirt. Yay! <laughs> How about that? Oh, and then of course, our spout and stuff, you know, that still works with our, whoops, I still have the 2000 thing on. <laughs> so now we have pumpkins and gumdrops. It's fun. You guys, that, you guys know I only added that, uh, Something thing in there because I'm <laughs> Nice. What's up, Eric? I was wondering, so with those pumpkins, would they also be affected? Are they considered a game object or would it only be they, the policy? Yeah, anything. First of all, everything you can put in a scene is a game object. Anything that has a mono behavior on it is a game object. Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, scriptable objects as well. Yes. So if you click on prefabs, uh, notice I have the pumpkin in here, right? Um, and you can totally make any prefab that you want. If I want to make a new sphere, uh, actually let's make a new make a new uh, plane. Do you want to shoot a plane? That that's a plane. Randall. Well, hold on. <laughs> You're getting a little crazy here. First of all, those aren't primitives. And a plane is a flat square, like a plane, not oh, like a flying okay. plane. But that would be cool. <laughs> you said that. I was like, wait. 
Uh, no, just, I mean, you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. As long as it, everything will affect uh, the same, as long as you put it on the uh, drops and is it collider, mesh, yeah. Uh, we make a uh, fax thing to have to do that. We can put that directly on our spout because we put this here. And we drop this in here. Now, Well, we don't have a rich body on it, so it's just sitting there, but notice our multicolored cylinders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's that rich body. Rich body allows things to have physics, which makes it I know, right? I don't even know what's going to do something blow up. Oh, boy. <laughs> hey, let's explode some stuff. Oh, our poor little explosion is too small to do anything. Just like barely moving. Wait, wait, we can play with that too. Hold on. Let's, uh, let's change our explosive force to like, I don't know, like 50? 75. Well, you don't break some stuff, bro. Oh, yeah, let's go 75. <laughs> Screw it, let's go 200. <laughs> boom! 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 Awesome! <laughs> yes! I like blowing stuff up! Isn't that fun? Okay, any questions before we network? No? Everybody, remember, all of those branches are out there already. Pull one, name it your some take on the thing, whatever, save it. Submit that thing to PR. Again, to get the Hacktober, oh, sorry. To get the Hacktoberfest shirt, you don't have to actually get it uh, approved. You just have to have the submission in there. We make sure, I'll, I don't know if I, I the Hacktoberfest has been linked in Slack, but I'll link it again tonight, just so you guys can go. It's a kind of a cool shirt to have. Show everybody what a nerd you are. Fun stuff, all right. We're done.